Hello and welcome to BookBeat, the place for all things literary. Our guest today is Brian Luderman. His most recent novel is called Nightfall. Brian, welcome to BookBeat. Thanks, Suella. Great to be back. Yes, we did an interview at your home in 2016. Right. This novel is the fourth of a series. Do you want to tell us a little bit? Sure. Sure. Uh, this series uh, features Penn Wilkinson, as you can see by the, the book. She's a young lady who is a paraplegic and who uh, uh, is featured in these mystery thriller books. And uh, she is an attorney and she is uh, paraplegic as a result of a car accident. And uh, she finds herself in a, a series of uh, uh, adventures in mm -hmm. these books. And uh, uh, this is the latest here in Nightfall, uh, a book that takes place uh, in the Twin Cities and uh, is, uh, features some very timely uh, topics in the news. Brian, tell us a little bit about the beginning of Nightfall. Better yet, would you like to read an opening? Be happy to. Near Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, one year ago, Mark Tomlinson was in for the ride of his life. It would also be the last ride of his life. The Range Rover, its transmission in neutral, rolled slowly forward, beginning Tomlinson's journey from this world to the next. It was dark now, but in the moonlight, he could identify the familiar scenery on the steep road leading down to the village south of the big tourist city. But he wouldn't make it to the village, the adopted home he and Heather had come to love so much. The Range Rover was rolling downhill now, but Tomlinson couldn't press the brake pedal. Both of his legs were broken, useless. He hoped the journey would end quickly, fulfilling his life's only remaining goal, making the pain stop. Tomlinson had known that this man, or someone like him, would be coming. The calm, stocky figure with the New York accent had been waiting for him in his living room in the dark when he'd returned from town. His question had been predictable. Where are the copies of the you tried to give to the blogger, Mark? A simple, straightforward question. There were any of n number of answers he could give, but none that would save his life. The car was picking up speed, weaving but staying within the trench-like path that had been created for the road. Ahead lay a 90-degree turn to the right, down to the village, but Tomlinson couldn't turn the wheel to stay on the road. Both of his arms were dislocated. He had held out hope that the insurance policy he had left with his attorney, Dr. Cardenas, would preserve the evidence, if not his life. But the man had quickly qualified his question about the whereabouts of the copies he sought. Other than the one copy you gave to Dr. Cardenas, Mark, we've already retrieved that one. You should have paid him better. And so the questioning had resumed, and a long night of unimaginable pain had begun. It would end soon. You have to have additional copies, the man had said. Where are they? Tomlinson had tried several different answers, but none had been sufficiently convincing. Thus the journey. He had pleaded with the man to simply kill him, but his inquisitor had demurred. Sorry, Mark, even in Mexico, they might investigate a non-cartel killing, but not an accident. And in the unlikely event an autopsy was performed, Tomlinson realized, he would find broken bones, dislocated joints, and massive bruises nothing that couldn't be explained by a car crash. As the car rushed toward the sharp turn and the high cliff beyond, Tomlinson thought about Heather, his wife, who had died a month earlier. Would he be reunited with her at the end of the journey? And then he thought about the decision that it had brought him to this point made many years ago to go into business with a man he had always known would turn against him, against the world. The tree cover opened up and the black expanse of the Pacific stretched endlessly in front of him. The Range Rover left the road and soared off the cliff toward the ocean, toward Heather, toward the end. 
Ooh, that is, that is stunning. This opening uh, doesn't really come into play until much later in the book when, when you find out who this character really is and, and what really happened uh, and, and how it ties into the rest of the story. The, uh, after this opening, then we begin to uh, uh, find out how Penn uh, becomes involved and, and how she uh, is investigating a murder. This is the first of the Penn Wilkinson books where uh, that is really a murder mystery. Penn is investigating uh, a killing that takes place. And it's uh, uh, an interesting crime, if I can uh, <laughs> classify right it ahead. that way. Um, Penn's boyfriend, James, uh, um, whom she lives near in California, uh, has an ex-wife and a daughter here in Minnesota. and. Uh, her current husband is charged with murder. And the murder, as I said, is interesting for several reasons. The victim is a uh, wealthy CEO. Uh, he is a current candidate for governor of Minnesota. And so there's a political aspect of it. He is also the accused uh, murderer's brother-in-law, so there is a family element to it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, he is also a white man. The accused murderer is a black man, so there is a racial element to it. And so that there are several layers of uh, controversy and meaning and uh, things that Penn has to try to, to deal with and unravel as she tries to discover the truth of who really killed this prominent person. Mm -hmm. And what occurred to me as I read the book that it was like almost like unpeeling the, the layers of an onion or unraveling a skein of yarn. Right, I think many uh, mysteries are like that and, and, and I meant, as I mentioned, there are several skeins that she has to deal with immediately, uh, several layers to try to pry back uh, and figure out what's relevant, what isn't, what happened with this murder. Mm -hmm. And can you say something about, she is an attorney. Right. But she's not practicing now. That's correct. Why? Well, she was an attorney before her car accident that uh, left her a paraplegic. Uh, she was a personal injury attorney representing injured plaintiffs. After the accident, her employer let her go. They were concerned that an attorney in a wheelchair would uh, attract sympathy that properly belonged from the jury that properly belonged to their client, to the injured client. And so uh, she was an outstanding attorney, but they, they let her go. Uh, she later began practicing law again as a prosecutor uh, in California. Uh, however, that employer has also let her go uh, for a different reason. Uh, she was involved in some uh, incidents that received publicity, and those are described in in my book, uh, Freefall, which I can talk about a little later if you'd like. Yes. And, um, uh, and she received some very favorable publicity for uh, resolving a, a situation and, and uh, carrying on an investigation uh, in Minnesota. And uh, the powers that be felt that that was a, a distraction and, and they also felt that one of their underlings receiving favorable publicity, which didn't do anything for them, or even worse, may have reflected poorly on her superiors, uh, was something they just really didn't want. And so they kind of quietly eased her out of that job as well. And as nightfall opens, she is uh, coming to grips with being unemployed again and uh, uh, figuring out where she goes uh, next with her life. Seeing the world in a uh, different way that, that we see through her eyes as, as we're reading the book. She literally looks up at the world, uh, being in a 
wheelchair. She encounters uh, people who are sympathetic, people who are helpful, people who are insensitive, people who are awkward. And so we learn some things about ourselves, about our culture, uh, when we see her as a paraplegic. We also see a person who is pretty darn resourceful. Uh, uh, not only just, uh, I think anybody who's a paraplegic needs to be resourceful just to, to cope with a world that is not really built for them, but uh, also dealing with some uh, crimes, some investigations, some uh, things that are potentially dangerous. Dealing with all that, she has to be resourceful in order to be successful. So I, I think for those two reasons, uh, those are reasons why uh, people like Penn. But I think there's uh, maybe even a deeper reason than that. I, I think uh, there's something universal about her journey as she goes through these stories. I, I think she is trying to discover who she is and she's doing it in a unique way, in a way that most of us never have to do and that is uh, with everything stripped away, her, her career, her uh, uh, fiance dropped her after the accident, her employer dropped her after the accident, uh, everything she was, her identity uh, really kind of fell away uh, and so she's left with kind of a blank slate trying to figure out who, I, who am I without all of these things. It's the same journey we're all on but she has to do that in a unique way and I think we can all identify with that as we, as she kind of uh, deals with different situations, makes different decisions and tries to uh, discover who she is. Well she certainly makes a bold statement in, in the novel. Uh, she, as you say, she's resourceful, but she's also very assertive, and she doesn't harbor much nonsense from people. Well, that's right, yeah. She, she does have a, a bit of a, maybe some sharp elbows in uh, uh, resolving these investigations, and uh, uh, some, she's rather opinionated, and uh, and assertive, as you said, and uh, it's um, I think she has to be absolutely. And I do have, uh, as we discussed, I, I do have a, a little bit of an excerpt that I uh, wrote for my next uh, Penn Wilkinson novel in process, and which maybe kind of sums it up as she's discussing her situation with a. A young man, and if I could read that for you, would you um, please? That would it, help. It's um, uh, he glanced at the wheelchair, an accident, a car accident. Yes, he looked at me expectantly. I didn't want to talk about this. I seldom did. I was an achiever. I said, strong and athletic, and confident and successful. Wow, and and insufferable. He was silent. I had it all. I had everything except character. And that always comes the hard way. He looked at the wheelchair again. Pretty hard. Yeah. Mm. That about sums it up, my goodness, yes. Oh. How, how, as a man, do you write in a female voice? What, what Very carefully. <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> but what kind of tools do you use from, do you have women read your narratives and read your dialogue? I do. And I, I, I have my wife and daughter, <coughs> who I rely on primarily. Um, in part just to get the girl stuff right, you know, what, what about the clothes and the, uh, the fashion and uh, that type of thing. But also, as you've said, to, to get the, the voice right. Is this how women think? Is it, would it be unrealistic or is this too much like a, a guy would, uh, would uh, think about a problem or is this something a guy would say? And I'm not sure how I got myself into this, setting myself up as a uh, 
to write in a female voice with a with a female uh, character, but it, it's a blast. It's really been a challenge for me, and I find myself listening carefully to all the people around me to see um, if uh, uh, how I should be doing this, and it, it's it's quite a challenge. But so far, I I've been told I I, I do in general get it right. Mm-hmm. You do. Um. How important is place to your novels? I noticed at least partially the story takes place in Minnesota. Right. Well, it it varies uh, a bit from one of my books to, to the uh, other. This is a Minnesota book, Nightfall. As you see, there's even a Minneapolis skyline That's there. Right. And uh, uh, it, it starts out a little bit in California as she uh, uh, is approached to solve this um, Minnesota problem. It's the kind of book that could take place uh, probably anywhere in the United States, but uh, it wouldn't be as good as it is in Minnesota. Um, these are issues that exist throughout the country and, and problems that exist, but we look at it uh, in this book through Minnesota eyes, with Minnesota sensibility, with, with this idea that we uh, have this level of tolerance and civility here uh, that maybe doesn't exist in some other parts of the country. And so we, we might view uh, the action in this story a little differently. And I think this is a book really does have to take place in Minnesota. OK. Can you talk a little bit about the illustrator? It's, it's a very minimalist illustration, but it focuses in on the whole message of the book. Right. Uh, the, uh, here's a, a little piece of irony. The uh, uh, illustrator is a, a lady who lives in California. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was, was going for, as you say, a, a minimalist look. And uh, I, I wanted it to be a Minnesota book, and, and thus the uh, uh, minimal uh, type skyline of Minneapolis there. And as in all uh, four of my covers, uh, uh, th the wheelchair is, um, is a part of that and a, and a prominent part of that. And then my illustrator suggested, well, it's, it's a murder. How about a little blood dripping from the, uh, mm -hmm. from the top, which kind of accents it a little bit. And, uh, and so I, I do like the cover. My previous cover was, was an almost entirely a white cover, and, and this one uh, I, I said, let's go the other way with it. Let's make it a black color. Talk about the role of time in your novels. Uh, there's some flashbacks that I noticed in mm -hmm. this story. Yeah, time comes into play in, in several ways. Uh, first of all, it is a present day book, and, and by that I mean very present day. It deals with some issues here in, that are uh, very prominent right now. Uh, we face a, it, it features prominently a, a, an election for governor of Minnesota, and it features uh, uh, the issue of uh, use of force by police, uh, uh, shootings of, of suspects, which becomes a, uh, uh, which is uh, a very uh, uh, prominent issue right now uh, in Minnesota, and uh, features prominently in the book. Um, and s some other political issues. Uh, the issues of political tone and civility uh, do come into play uh, a bit. I think uh, it's timely in that sense. Time also comes into play in, in a couple of other ways. First of all, there is a thread uh, in the story that takes place 30 years ago through a series of flashbacks through these same characters when they're uh, teenagers. And they, um, are, are witnesses to a police shooting, uh, the, the father actually of, of one of the uh, characters, uh, which took place 30 years ago, and so, and, and which ties into what's happening in the story today. So that comes into play in that way. And then there's also time in a relative sense. Um, uh, within the story, there is a uh, sense of working against the clock. Uh, of uh, the time ticking down toward the election where the characters are, are scrambling, Penn is scrambling to figure out what happened uh, so she can 
uh, prevent further violence, prevent further murders, and and prevent characters from inciting violence um, through manipulation of the uh, uh, police uh, shootings and of the issues uh, involved with that. And so the time becomes very critical ticking down. Now, I'm not, I, I think there's an element of that in many uh, mysteries and, and thrillers. I'm not as much of a slave to it as, say, Dan Brown, who has all of his books take place within a 24-hour period. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's extreme time pressure, or, or Jeffrey Deaver would be another example of, a, uh, of an author who uses a, uh, extreme time pressure. I'm not quite as wedded uh, to that, but I think it, it is an element in all of my books, and uh, certainly to some extent in Nightfall. Okay. We talked a little bit about writing in a female voice. Can you talk mm -hmm. about voice in your novels? Right, I, I do write in the first person uh, voice of uh, pen for the most part. There, there's also, it, it's a hybrid first and third person narration. I also do have third person uh, uh, scenes. We look in on what the bad guys are doing and what some of the other uh, characters are doing from time to time. Uh, and that is done in a third person. Um, my style, my voice that I write in, I think is I would describe as somewhat minimalist. Uh, I don't use a lot of uh, elaborate descriptiveness. Uh, I don't use a lot of creative metaphors. I, I don't, uh, I just try to tell the story and, and uh, stay out of the way. I, I try to do what Elmore Leonard does and he says, he looks at his uh, manuscript after he's written it and he said, if it sounds like writing, I cut it. And that's my, pretty much my philosophy too. If it sounds uh, like something that distracts you from, this, uh, from the story and, and calls attention to the writing, that is something I try to avoid. And so I would say it, it's more of a minimalist type voice uh, that I do. You've got a female character that you're writing, female main character. You've got flashbacks, mm -hmm. you've got different places in the country, different, how do you keep it all straight? Uh, with great difficulty. I, it's, it, I do have to work to keep it straight and I have to work uh, even a little harder than most writers do because I write in kind of a disjointed way. Uh, I don't sit down for several hours and just write. I, because of the circumstances in my life. I have to do it in snatches. A few minutes here, a few minutes there, while I'm waiting in the car, while I'm waiting in line somewhere. Uh, when I do whatever I can, whenever I can. And that, that kind of creates problems <coughs> for continuity and flow uh, for, the, for the writing. And so uh, I am an outliner. Uh, unlike some writers who just sit there with a, a blank screen and uh, just start writing and they aren't sure where they're going. They just uh, go with the flow and, and uh, write the story. I have to know where I'm going and, and try to stay organized. Uh, and so I do use pretty extensive outlines and uh, uh, I, I really need to do that because of the disjointed way in which I put time in. I wrote my first two books on a Palm Pilot and I'm I'm dating myself a little bit there, but that is not obviously ideal with the tiny screen and uh, with the awkwardness in, in shifting it around and, and so forth. But as I say, I, I, I do what I can when I can, and uh, if you want to do it bad enough, you find a way. Well, you started talking a little bit about the process of bringing a book to life with the Palm Pilot. Mm -hmm. Are you post-it note taker? Do you write on the backs of things? No, I, I use my uh, phone. Uh, I have a little note taking application there and whenever I think of something that I want to include or that needs to be included, I just pull it out and, and just make a note to deal. Or if I'm driving or something, I use the voice recorder uh, just to dictate something that I need to do later on and, and uh, so that I've got a record of it and I'm getting to the age where I do need to make a note of it otherwise I will mm -hmm. forget. 
Are you a note taker, writing on the backs of things? What do you do? I am a note taker, but I, I don't use the backs of envelopes or post-it notes. I'm, I use uh, my phone, uh, the note taking application uh, on my phone, or I use the voice recorder on my phone to dictate uh, what I do next. Because I do think of things uh, while I'm driving or while I'm doing things, and I, I'm sure uh, m most writers do, and, and I need to write those down or I will forget. You read us a little snippet of what's coming up in the next Penn Wilkinson mm -hmm. book, but could you talk a little bit about the first three? Sure. Um, the first book was <coughs> in the Penn Wilkinson series, and I should mention I did write two other mysteries uh, back in the last decade in in 2002 and 2004, they were called Bound to Die and Poised to Kill, which I uh, uh, I think were good books. They, they're kind of hard to find now, but uh, I took some time off to uh, deal with uh, uh, some health issues and some uh, family issues to help raise my, my kids. And uh, so when I came back in 2014, I, uh, I wanted a series character, and uh, and that's where I got the idea for Penn Wilkinson. And this is the first Penn Wilkinson book. It's called Downfall. And um, in this book, Penn is coming back from her accident. Uh, she's been unemployed, and she finds a job in Minnesota uh, with a large bank here. And she soon learns that that job and the people who are employing her are, are not what they seem, that she is uh, being manipulated, brought here for a reason as part of a larger scheme, um, which is described in detail in the book. And, and uh, as she unravels this scheme, she uh, uh, gets into some trouble and some danger herself, and she is forced to leave this job and she actually follows a trail to California to uh, find out um, what's going on and in the course of that she meets um, James Carter who is the CEO of uh, the bank that she works for and he is also a victim of this corporate sabotage scheme that's described uh, and James figures uh, as a character to uh, a varying extent in uh, the later books. Okay. And then the uh, follow-up to Downfall is called Windfall. Uh, this takes place a little more in uh, the action, a little more in California, uh, where Penn has, as I said, it, has uh, begun work as a uh, federal prosecutor, and she faces a dual challenge in Windfall. One is uh, she undertakes the prosecution of a corrupt congressman. And that soon goes awry when her key witness goes missing in Minnesota, and she's forced to come back here and, and, and look for this witness. And there are other indications that things are not right with this prosecution, that things are, are being manipulated at higher levels, uh, and she's forced to deal with that. At the same time, her friend James is accused of a murder. Uh, he is arrested and uh, charged with the murder of an ex-girlfriend. And, and actually, uh, the only other suspect in the crime would be Penn herself, <laughs> who has w potentially a, uh, a motive for that crime. And so she, uh, while dealing with this prosecution, also has to clear herself and clear James of this uh, crime. And uh, she, discovers a much larger and, uh, and more serious scheme in uh, dealing with both of these crimes. And, and they do uh, come together in a, uh, a pretty action-packed ending. Now, those are the two books that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, because when we talked in 2016, those had just come out. Right. And you had talked about your earlier two novels in the early 2000s. Right. Talk about this third one. Free Fall uh, takes place mostly in Minnesota. She, Penn is still working as a prosecutor, but just barely. She's, she's hanging on to her job, and, 
and just at a critical time when she is, is uh, handling her first big trial solo, her nephew in Minnesota goes missing. And her nephew is an interesting fellow. He's an 18-year-old computer prodigy. And he lives with his father uh, in Minnesota. Um, his mother is Penn's sister, who, who lives in Florida, where Penn and, uh, also uh, grew up and began her career. And so, so Kenny is his name. When he goes missing, Penn uh, has to leave her trial, come up here to Minnesota and look f for him. And she soon discovers that he is mixed up with some very dangerous people, with some uh, mercenaries, with some uh, Russian uh, thugs, uh, other hackers, and uh, he has gotten himself into a, a very dangerous situation. And it uh, involves uh, a scheme involving some large <coughs> players in the Minnesota business community who are in conflict with each other, one of whom Penn is very familiar with, who was involved in downfall uh, with the uh, bank that she worked for. And so Penn needs to find Kenny, and to do that, she needs to find out what's going on, who these people are, and what their uh, ultimate scheme is. And uh, in doing that, she ends up in uh, some very dangerous situations, including the, the climax of the book where she is, um, uh, has a confrontation in the middle of the Hennepin Avenue Bridge in Minneapolis um, with a gun to her head. And so I'll, uh, I'll leave I'll, us I'll to leave, find I'll out. Leave, I'll leave it at that. To find out. And, huh. and I, I should mention that in the, in the course of these stories, the, the impact on Penn as a person is cumulative. She doesn't just shrug it off and go to the next story. And that's something that kind of bugs me about uh, a number of stories. The, the, the heroes are, are bulletproof. They go on to the next uh, thing, uh, regardless of what they've been through in the past and, and what they've had to deal with. And Penn uh, finds herself uh, drawn to these investigative situations, uh, finds out that she's actually good at digging out the truth in high stakes situations and, and, and in helping people in doing that. She feels drawn to that and in her journey to find out who she is, she, she believes that that's an important part of it, that this is part of who she is and what she does, using her talents and her um, uh, empathy to help people in these situations. But she pays a price for doing that. And she, uh, at the beginning of nightfall, is uh, faced with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, uh, and she resists uh, receiving help for that, professional help, because she wants to remain independent. She feels uh, that being a paraplegic, she's vulnerable, and, and she can't allow herself to be thought uh, weak and helpless. She needs to hang on to her independence and that becomes a point of controversy uh, between her and, and James and it becomes a uh, uh, hindrance in uh, another obstacle in uh, resolving the mysteries in Nightfall. You talked a little bit about bringing the book to life, Nightfall and the others. Is there anything more you'd like to say about your process? Well, I generally start with a premise uh, and uh, you know what if what if this type of scheme I, I generally start with the crime or the the scheme and 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 work from there and and uh, I have a couple of characters to work with Penn and and James uh, are recurring characters uh, her nephew Kenny has I think become a recurring character uh, since uh, free fall and uh, He's a useful guy to have around. Uh, uh, computer hackers always, uh, I, I think most detectives have some kind of resources or person that they, they use for that. And in this case, it's uh, uh, Penn's nephew, Kenny, that she uses for a cyber investigation. Um, and so starting with those characters and that premise, I just kind of build from there. I, I build the story. Uh, uh, in building the characters, I kind of use 
uh, I go at it from two different ways, uh, functional and uh, imaginative. Uh, uh, there's a functional aspect to building a character. You have to ask, what kind of character do I need for this situation? Uh, what does this character need to be like? What do they need to do? What kind of characteristics do they need to have to fulfill the functions of the story? And then, of course, it works the other way around. Once you have those characteristics, what does that character then do? What are they inclined to, uh, uh, to do next in the story uh, when you have that? If you have a uh, character, for example, who, who has uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, as I do in Nightfall, well, I, uh, what does that character do next? Uh, what would they do in this situation? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And then part of the, so there's that functional aspect and part of it is just imaginative. Uh, you just, I just kind of start with uh, something in my mind or I, sometimes I start with an actual person or actual character and then try to grow the character from there and just let my imagination go and, and figure out what, uh, what is this person really like. Okay. It's, what I'm hearing is, is a kind of holistic approach. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and you know, I can't really answer the chicken and egg question. You know, does the does the story come first or does the character come first? I think for me, it works both ways. I, I think most of the best characters or stories start with the characters and let the story grow uh, out of uh, what they are like and, and what they want and uh, what they need to do. Uh, but there, there are some um, situations where the story dictates the character too. I need somebody here who does this, who fulfills this function, who reacts off of this character. And so it's, it's kind of a perpetual chicken and egg and I think that's, that is what makes it a holistic process. Do you have other works in the pipeline? You mentioned the fifth book. Yes. Uh, um, the uh, next Penn Wilkinson book, I'm, I'm well into the uh, process of writing that. Uh, I do have the, uh, my preliminary outline completely done. Um, it will take some time yet. I, I haven't really uh, thought about any non-Penn Wilkinson projects. I, I just uh, feel that this is a compelling series, w which I... Uh, uh, feel the need to keep going and, and find out what Penn does next, although I, I could see myself doing uh, uh, some other stories. And, uh, and I've asked my readers to help me with the title for this one because, um, you know, I, I'm uh, committed to doing the falls. Uh, they all have to end with a fall, and I, I don't know um, what to place in front of this fall. There aren't as many fall titles as there are like prey titles, you know, mm -hmm. for John Sanford. So I, I, I'll draw on my uh, reader's suggestion to uh, help with that when the time comes. Okay, okay. Talk a little bit about your publisher. My publisher is Conquill Press. It's an independent uh, press uh, based here in St. Paul. It's, uh, it's an author's cooperative press. Uh, it's founded by two uh, local mystery authors, Christopher Ballin and Jennifer LeClaire. Uh, and we are entirely mystery based. Uh, that's the only type of uh, story that we do. We have uh, six authors, uh, uh, Jennifer and Chris, myself, and we also have uh, three other names that uh, Minnesota mystery fans may recognize, Chuck Logan, uh, Steve Thayer, and Richard Thompson, all excellent authors. They were all with traditional presses, but they have uh, um, landed with our authors co-op press. And, and in creating Conquill Press, uh, Chris and Jennifer uh, put together all the resources that we need to uh, uh, that a publisher needs to put out our books. The editors, the uh, copy people, the, the uh, uh, e-book people, the cover designers, uh, the distributors, uh, all of that kind of thing. They've made those resources available to all the authors of Conquill Press and it's, uh, uh, it's been a great arrangement for us and they, they've been very generous in, in, 
and putting this all together and uh, uh, it's it's really been a I, I was looking for a home after I was out of the publishing for some years I was with a, a small traditional press and and the landscape had changed quite a bit when I came back uh, the, the large publishers New York publishers are probably dropping more authors than they're adding and and so um, uh, this was an ideal solution for me is uh, uh, a smaller size local independent and and best of all run by mystery authors who uh, understand what we need to put out these books and put out I think very high quality books okay that's I didn't realize it was a cooperative I had seen the name before Right. on books, but I didn't realize it was a cooperative. Right. We're getting to the end of our time right mm -hmm. now. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, I guess just how much I've enjoyed uh, this process, enjoyed interacting with the readers, enjoyed talking to folks like you, uh, and most of all enjoyed the, the writing process itself. It, it really is a sort of an addiction. I, I can't imagine myself uh, not doing it. and. Um, I'm just having a lot of fun, and, and, and I like hearing from the readers how much they like the stories and how much they like Penn, and uh, just uh, hope to, uh, to keep going with it. Fabulous. You have something else to read for us. I do have a, another excerpt from Nightfall, uh, which takes place at a, a later stage in the book. And to set the stage, Penn and her uh, um, and her nephew Kenny, who is helping in, in this book as well, they they need to track down somebody's alibi uh, to to actually uh, break that alibi and uh, to place these people at a motel in South Minneapolis. I need pictures of everybody. I said, Jenna, Lauren, and Justin. Kenny went to work and within a couple of minutes had printed out the three images. Justin's had been the hardest to find, but Kenny had finally found a picture on a friend's Facebook page. I was relieved. He wouldn't have to hack into the state driver's license registry as I, he'd offered to do. I took the pictures, folded them, and put them in my purse. I should get going. I really appreciate all your help, Kenny. Wait, he said. For what? I'm going with you. Kenny, look, Aunt Penn, it's not like I'm a tough guy or anything, but you need somebody with you. I know what happened to Brad Van Ness and Jane Heiser. And you say McCourt hasn't threatened you, but I'm not so sure about that. I'm already uneasy enough about that house you're staying at. They need more security. I knew I shouldn't have let him come. His mother would be furious about my involving him further, but he was apparently going to pester me about it. And in truth, I wouldn't mind some company. I'll pick you up at 8. We waited until 8.30 that night which was about the time Justin Jorgensen would have gotten to the motel on the night of the murder. I hoped some of the same staff might be on duty. I picked up Kenny at his dorm at the University of Minnesota and we drove southeast along Hiawatha Avenue in the direction of the airport. It was a fairly dark stretch of road with railroad tracks, grain elevators, and industrial properties on our left and residential neighborhoods and light rail line on our right. The High 46 Motel was a slightly dubious two-story place with about 20 units laid out perpendicular to the road. I parked across the lot from the office next to a no vacancy sign. Wait here, I told Kenny. Are you sure? Yes, you'll be able to see me through the window to the office. He reluctantly agreed and helped me into my wheelchair and down the ramp. There are only a couple of cars in the lot, but I noticed a smaller side lot which appeared to be full. Guess exercising discretion, I figured. The guy behind the desk was a huge man with bulging eyes, greasy brown hair, and a scraggly grotee. He stood up from the, his television program right away, but made no move to help me as I struggled to get through the door. On my third try, I was finally able to yank the door open and roll myself through. I took a moment to catch my breath, then tried my winning smile. Hi, I said. We're full. Not a problem, I just have a question. He was on full alert. He said nothing, as if in acknowledging my question he might somehow incriminate himself. I pulled the folded picture of Justin out of my purse. I started to hold it up for him, but he held his hand up, 
wait a minute, are you a cop? PI? I'm an attorney. For who? My client is a defendant in a criminal trial. I pulled out my attorney ID, which he also pushed away. No subpoena, he said, no court order. Well, not yet, but can't help you. Now look, if you could just take a minute. You heard a hearing? I said no. This time his tone was downright menacing. Go back and get a court order. All right, I will, I lied. You could save us all some time. Lady, I don't give a rat's ass about your time. You don't have a court order, take a freaking hike. I was infuriated, but there was nothing I could do. Fine, I said. Meanwhile, you can take your vibrating beds, your hourly rates, and your charming personality and deposit them in a remote orifice where the sun never shines. His face turned red. You wash your mouth, lady. He stepped forward as if to come out from behind the counter, and I instantly regretted shooting my mouth off. I struggled back through the door and out into the parking lot. The guy hadn't followed. Wiping sweat off my forehead, I rolled back to the van, where Kenny was nowhere to be seen. I rolled right up to the van and looked again, but Kenny was gone. Panicky, I glanced around the parking lot, which was deserted. Oh, God, what was I going to tell Marcia? I pondered calling 911, but if Kenny had been taken, it was already too late. I decided to proceed cautiously down the side parking lot. At home in California, I kept a knife in my van and a little canister of pepper spray on my key ring, but I hadn't been able to bring either of them on the plane to Minnesota. I settled for keeping my phone on in one hand with 911 punched in. Aunt Penn? I jerked around. Kenny was approaching me from a side door, followed by another man. I exhaled and put my phone away. Kenny, what on earth? Sorry, he said, but I saw Carlos here going over toward the dumpster for a smoke break and I thought I'd show him the picture. I was too relieved to be mad at him. Go on. He held up Jenna's picture displayed on his phone. He told me he's seen her here. When, I asked. Kenny asked the man, a young guy with acne-scarred skin and a cigarette in his mouth, in Spanish. Carlos replied and Kenny translated. He says more than once. The most recent time was probably a couple of weeks ago. Time frame fit, I thought. How many times, I asked. Kenny asked him and this time I understood the response. Carlos shrugged and said, tres o cuatro. Who was she with? Kenny asked, and this time the reply was longer. He's sure she was with a man, Kenny reported, but he doesn't really remember anything about the guy. I held out the picture of Justin. Carlos nodded immediately. See. Can he be any more specific as to the date? I asked. Maybe he could narrow it down to a specific day of the week? After a lengthy reply, Kenny translated. He said it wouldn't have been a Monday or a Tuesday since he doesn't work on those days. Other than that, he just doesn't know. He did notice that they didn't stay the entire night. I'd run out of questions. Even if I could get my hands on the motel's register, it, it wouldn't help, assuming they'd use phony names. I thanked Carlos and pulled some money from my purse. The young man shook his head, refusing the payment. I hope I didn't get you in trouble with the manager, I said, glancing back toward the office. Kenny passed that along to Carlos, who shrugged, chuckled, and gave a short response. He says the manager's an asshole, Kenny reported. <laughs> I smiled and shook Carlos's hand. I didn't know you studied Spanish, I said as we returned to the van. I didn't study it exactly, I sort of picked it up. I shook my head, wondering yet again what it must be like to be a genius. We got ourselves buckled into the van. I looked over at Kenny, whose excitement was palpable. Hand Penn, you did it. You know who killed Lofton. You even know how it happened. I exhaled. What on earth do we do now? Oh. Great, great narrative. Great dialogue. It's really an exciting book. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And it kind of accelerates from there toward the uh, uh, climax, toward the ending. And I, I think uh, readers will... Uh, will not come away unsatisfied reading the ending. I think they are right. We're reaching the end of our time, and is there anything further that you'd like to add? I'm glad you got this excerpt prepared to read. Mm -hmm. Our audience is going to be thrilled. Well, I, I would just uh, 
encourage readers, if they're interested, uh, check out my website, brianluderman.com, uh, and uh, provide more details about the books, about where you can get them, about a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, uh, um, th these books have been pretty well received. I think the people will enjoy it. Thank you for joining us at BookBeat, the place for all things literary. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. It was a treat to see you again, and I'll look forward to that fifth book. Thank you. And audience, thank you for joining us at BookBeat, the place for all things literary. We look forward to seeing you next time.